And so before we together begin to submerge into our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is the book of Luke. Verse 24, or chapter 24, verse 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so that we as the participants of the body of Christ would share together with Christ all the things that are written about him in Scripture, we will continue to study our collaboration with the truth of the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit revealing the truth in our heart, looking at what we need to do from our side to receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can put on the new way of life. This is the true calling of all of the children of God that are born from God that are part of His family. If a child of God will not understand their calling, their names will be blotted out of the book of life because our calling is not evangelism, but the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new way of life. As soon as this will happen, you become a light to the world, and then it doesn't matter where you are. You are a light to the world, and you already are an evangelist. But when an evangelist, not understanding this, Con consider themselves evangelists, they think they are bringing and drawing people to God. What God are you drawing them to? The devil has uh, impersonated himself as Jesus Christ, giving people gifts of the Holy Spirit, anointing, and replacing uh, the anointer, the giver, the blesser with the things that God has and people worship the gift and people think that they inherit eternal life because they evangelize because they do good work that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created in accordance to God in true righteousness and holiness Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 this is written also in Colossians the scripture starting from the first verse of the Bible and finishing with the last uh, verse in Revelations has one purpose and the Son of God came and was incarnated for this purpose if we did not need to save our bodies then he would not have the necessity then to have come to this earth he came here and he died with his body for the purpose of destroying within our body the stronghold of death and erecting the stronghold of life within our body. Jesus said, what good is it that you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Or what price will a person give for a soul? Today, for the most part, Christianity don't understand what an altar is, what an offering is, what the wood upon the altar is, and what the fire is that burns upon this altar. Who lights it up? What is this fire? To fulfill this commanding order, we have been studying three vital, charging, and fundamental acts, and these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. We have noted that it is specifically your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting acts to put off, be renewed, and put on that will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. Or more specifically, will the actualization of our salvation come to pass that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it forever will, that will then result in our names being forever blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there at one time? In a specific format, we already studied the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we can begin the process of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and 
holy truth. Relevant to this, we already looked at a series of parables and events. We became familiar with the condition that we need to fulfill so that we can, by the name of God, El El Yon, or God Most High, to destroy the stronghold of death in our body in the form of the reigning in its sin, identifying the essence of our old person with his deeds, so that we can forever thrust him out from our body into hell with noise, and afterwards erect the kingdom of heaven within our body, that is the stronghold of, of eternal life and have stopped to study the next condition and this is in the 18th Psalm of David where the Holy Spirit that with the right that he and power that he alone has reveals the condition based upon which we are called to collaborate our faith prayer with the name of God El El Yon or God Most High and this condition is that in the circumstances of our hardship in life we are putting off the old man we can then call upon the Most High as to our God and confess the faith of our hearts stating who God is to us in Christ Jesus what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and who we are to God in Christ Jesus. We've noted that this metaphor is one of the most powerful and voluminous symbols demonstrating the collaboration of our renewed mind in the form of King David with the name of God Most High and the confrontation of our carnal mind in the form of King Saul and reigning sin in the form of our old person with his deeds. It's not enough that the kingdom of heaven abide within our heart. It needs to abide not just in our spirit, but also in our soul and our body. And we see that David had a problem. The kingdom of heaven was within his heart, but it was not within his soul and his mind or even his body because in order for this to happen he began to cast off the old person with his deeds it is by the means of the confession of the faith of our heart stating who God is to us in Christ Jesus confessing the faith of our heart stating who God is to us in Jesus Christ and what God has done in Jesus Christ and who we are to God God receives the required basis or the grounds that he needs to join the battle for our earthly bodies in order to shame the reigning in our body sin, the old person by the power of his redemption and forever cast him into hell with noise. In character, the Per Psalm of David contains three parts where we see an example of the character of legitimate prayer. And this prayer is inherent only to kings, priests, and prophets, not just kings. Saul was a king. He was anointed, an anointed king, but he was not an anointed priest or an anointed prophet. And so this dramatically ended his life. And people think that if they're able to control their body and rule over their body, that this is sufficient. This is not sufficient. You need to collaborate your mind with your spirit, with your priest. And you need to have within your spirit the Urim and the Thummim <clears throat> so that you can be a prophet of the Most High. The first part identifies the condition of David's heart as a warrior in prayer. The condition of his heart was grounds for the legitimate status of his prayer which is only for kings, priests, and prophets. The second part reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer, which gives God the basis to deliver David from the hand of all of his enemies. This is the thought or this revelation is inaccessible for carnal men or infants in Christ. It's so inaccessible that it will prompt not just anger but uh, rejection also. They will not understand or see with their hearts. They will not be able to hear with their ears because this is only for kings, priests, and prophets because upon such altars of people that are carnal or infants in Christ, they don't actually even have an altar. They need to form themselves into an altar first 
they can think that they have it. They can think this, but they don't have it. Hagar did not have an altar, although God heard her because of the boy which was the son of Abraham. God hears these infants and periodically responds to them, and they begin to think that they are medians, that they're min, uh, min, intercessors, that they're able to. You are not an intercessor because you need to be a king. Uh, often they're not even kings, not able to control their emotions. If you're not a king, a, pri a priest, or a prophet, but only call yourself these things, then, of course, you don't have an altar, you don't have wood, you don't have fire, you don't have an offering. Your prayer is not an offering because you don't know how to pray properly. And when you pray, you present to him your interests, your pain, and you find in, in the scriptures places where he's obligated to fulfill your interests. But a priest knows that he cannot come to God uh, and bring his own pain, his own needs. He needs to form this pain and needs into God's will and present his pain as the will of God and not his own personal will or his own personal need. Because a priest does not represent himself or present his interests, he presents God's interests. The third part of the psalm, it's written in an epic format and it describes the prayer battle itself which surpasses the comprehension of the regular human mind. In a specific format, we already looked at the first part and stopped to look at the second part, which reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer contained in the eight names of God Most High. Why eight names? Because in this prayer, in this psalm, David presents his relationship with God within the boundaries of the covenant he made with God. When he presents ten names in his prayer, he shows his relationship uh, of holiness with God because number ten is a symbol of holiness, number uh, eight is a symbol of a covenant they circumcised an infant in the eighth day and gave him a name and so a name is always linked to covenant not when a person repents as some people think right now God writes his name during his repentance no God writes his name at the time when he dedicates himself to God in baptism of water if of course he understands what he's doing in the baptism if he doesn't understand it and makes uh, and is baptized of course his name is not written into the book of life because he doesn't understand the covenant that he's uh, he's joining he, he, it wasn't explained to this person what covenant he's 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 making and God's role and his role they say well you're just purifying yourself and serving God with a good conscience and they sometimes will <clears throat> provide this instruction for a month three months uh, testing a person's uh, perseverance that want to make a covenant with God although they themselves don't understand what they're saying and so getting to know and confessing the power contained in the heart of David in the eight following names of God allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so he could be saved from his enemies and for God discovering the truth revealing the power of his names because he David confessed the faith that was in his heart. He discovered this truth, revealing the power of his names in the heart of David. It provided God proper grounds to use his abilities that consist in his eight names to battle against the enemies of David. The angels also partake in the service. Their uh, goal, their role is that if a person confesses uh, a prayer of faith, they take this prayer. And we, with the Holy Spirit, they, with the help of the Holy Spirit, then bring this prayer to God. And when an angel <clears throat> brings this prayer to God, he is faced with a great resistance under the heavens because demons attack them and don't allow them through. And if a person understands this, then he waits and intensifies his prayer. And then God sends support for this angel help. And the prayer then... Uh, is is pushed through this resistance 
uh, to and gets to God. And so that you can receive uh, God's response, it also needs to break through this resistance. And we don't have authority and we can't command these demons under the heavens. We do not have any right to that. We only can rebuke what's on earth, but those that are under the heavens they are of a higher rank these ind- these fallen angels we have no right to communicate with them not to bind them we can bind only the old person but not demons the demons that are on earth we can rebuke when those angels fall to the earth then we will have the right to re- to bind them but while they're there we don't have the right why because the heavens are for the Lord, but the earth he gave to the Son of Men. And so, our Father, he taught us to pray. But keep me from the evil one, we say, because the evil one, he uh, takes on the form of an angel of light. The one on earth does not take on this form. But those that come down from there here, they do take the form of angels of light. They have great power of anointing and are able to use it in the church, and the church will actually uh, sense the, the strong presence and not differentiating the two. They'll think it's the Holy Spirit. There'll be miracles and signs. But if there's no truth in the heart, the elementary teaching of Christ, they will not be able to know the difference between good and evil and he is the evil one. This is especially dangerous. Those demons and those who have allowed themselves to uh, rebuke them, they have experienced in their lives a great destruction and are absolutely broken. And God does not protect them. Why? Because they, uh, the heavens are for the Lord. The earth he gave to the Son of Men. Allow God to work within his area. We have enough. We pray and the angels of God are able to bring our prayers there and through the resistance that they face uh, these demons that are there. And when we do this one and the second time and the third time, and if an angel already uh, brought a prayer to God and then brought it back, between us and God, there is now a a channel by which our prayers can easily co- go back and forth. Having broken this uh, this uh, army rank, and so in order to overcome them, they then fall to the earth. They don't all together fall, but the first prayer, second prayer, third prayer, they come down, and then. A person, it becomes easier to come to God. When it's easier for me. It's easier for me. When I come to God, I immediately receive responses. My spirit constantly is connected, and no one's in, in my way or disturbing that. My prayers are not uh, withheld. Before, they were withheld, and I needed to put extra effort and wait for it to come through. Today, I don't need to do that. I don't have that necessity anymore. Angels, the angels that serve me, uh, take my prayers and calmly take them and brings me responses. This is the service of angels. We are not going to go too much into it, but that's their service. David begins to pray, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Those who translated the, this uh, wrote the Lord with a big letter, but when you when they wrote the rest of the words here, uh, my shield, my rock, they wrote it with small letters, not understanding that they're God's names and need to also be capitalized. And so we have here seven or eight names. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my strength in whom I will trust. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is the horn of my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. 
if you will just communicate with God and tell Him who He is for you, as soon as you understand who He is for you, you don't just say strength, but you don't understand what <coughs> this name of God's strength contains and how you can work with His name strength. Uh, and when a person knows and understands what the strength is, what a, what fortress contains in others, he can calmly confess these names of God. And when he confesses them as the faith of his heart, then God takes these words and they become power and become as powerful as God's names. The angels take him to heaven, these prayers, and God cloaks us. Uh, by the Holy Spirit into our, our own words in a specific format as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith we already looked at our inherited lot that is in Christ Jesus in the power of four names of God the name of God's strength, rock, fortress and deliverer and stop to study our inherited lot that is in Christ Jesus in the name of God, Rock of Israel, listed as strength in whom we trust. We will remember that this nature of prayer where David confesses his lot in the eight existing names of God Most High is the strategic teaching that is purposed to be <coughs> the calling and the mantle of a king, a priest, and a prophet anointed to rule over their earthly body. And if a person has not accepted the given to him anointing to rule over his calling in the form of his earthly body in the status of a king, a priest, and a prophet, then so that he can be transformed into a heavenly body, then this revelation given for worshiping God in prayer will not benefit him but will only harm him because God will incriminate these words as idle words. He'll say, why is it that you speak words that are not in your heart? You don't understand them. How can you speak those things that you don't understand? The Jews, not understanding the name of God, Yahweh, were not able to st say it and replaced it with the name Adonai. And everywhere they replaced it with Adonai or Lord or master. Adonai is uh, as Lord, Lord you, that they used for, for men as well as God also. Therefore, the quality and lexus in identifying the name of God, Rock, as the previous names of God, has is not able to be found in any dictionary of the world. There will be some, uh, but not the complete definition of it. Rock is a sharp edge of a mountain or cliff, and when it's saying this, that means a living uh, mountain or living cliff, a stone, a stone defense, uh, <clears throat> living blood, the shadow of a cliff, even the shadow is living. Here, sh the shadows are not living because they can... <clears throat> they can uh, that you can have a shadow of a living person but the shadow is not living but here even the shadow is living because a person that is under the shadow will be blessed he will be within the atmosphere of God they will uh, sense this life of God from it victorious an elephant's tusk ivory which talks about a specific form of hardness the aspect of ruling you know that elephants they they are very large animals that uh, have that uh, that is led by typically a female and when Solomon made his throne of ivory and overlaid it with gold and there was no such throne in any other kingdom. No one had ever seen why he needed to use such an expensive uh, item as ivory. But here he made a throne of ivory and completely covered it with gold that you can't see what is under the gold. But there was ivory. God wanted to show something with this, that for him, his church is a leader 
uh, is, is led into the kingdom of heaven. The church needs to lead you. He is the leader that leads you to heaven. And talking about an I ivory or, or an elephant's tusk, uh, the, the elephant's uh, queen, as it is, would uh, leads her leads the entire group to water. I'm not going to talk about this uh, very in much detail, but it's uh, important. The aspect of ruling and comfort uh, is talking about rock. In the given prayer psalm of David, the name of God, rock, contains the inherited lot of the Son of God in whom and by whom a person collaborating with the power of the name of God, rock, as Rock of Israel receives the victorious ability to keep the proceeds or profits received from investing the silver of salvation. We turn our salvation to profit for the adopting of our body by the redemption of Christ. Considering such a necessary tandem or such a union between God and man, it becomes vital for us to determine in each aspect of our essence the role of God as well as the role of man. And for this purpose, studying our lot in the previous names of God, called to be the lot of our salvation, we have the necessity to study a series of questions. What are the characteristics and categories identifying our inherited lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel? What purpose does our inherited lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel, play when it comes to achieving our salvation? What price do we need to pay in order to give God the proper grounds that He needs to be our Rock of Israel? to lead us into the inheritance, into the lot of His name. Rock, by what results do we determine that God truly is our rock of Israel in fulfilling our calling and not some kind of counterfeit uh, of the false uh, or evil power? Not having clear and comprehensive answers to these questions that we can receive by being instructed in the faith within the strict order in which the body of Christ functions, we will not have any ability to turn our salvation so that it can profit us, the silver being our guarantee of salvation. And this means that without a strict and voluntary obedience of the preached word spoken by the person that possesses the power of a father from God as well as his helpers, we will have absolutely no opportunity to receive the profit of the fruit of righteousness from the seed of guarantee that we have invested. As it is written, for all of the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen, to the glory of God through us, 2 Corinthians 1.20. We... This is not something that carnal men like, especially those leaders that where the churches, there's no structure of theocracy. They want that the brotherly council decide, not the pastor decide. That's what they want. And you can't, uh, you can't uh, question the words of the Bible, though. <clears throat> As the Lord sends, me I send you. Those that you retain sins upon, they will be retained. Those you forgive, they, they'll be forgiven. So uh, people become afraid when they read uh, these places. I read, I've spoken with sincere uh, uh, pastors of the Pentecostal Church, Baptist Churches, and they are afraid. They say, we don't can't forgive the sins of men. They, when I showed them that you're required to do this, if you took upon yourself the responsibility of a pastor, and they say, I'm afraid. I don't know how to do this. I've never done it. Are you confident in the forgiveness of your sins? He says, no. So how then do you think that your sins will be forgiven? I need to lead a clean life. But I told him, uh, your sins aren't forgiven because you fast and lead a clean life. A forgiveness is an exclusive gift of God. You need to receive it upon conditions of God. A person needs to be taught how to receive forgiveness and how to receive justification so that you can receive it as a gift and only after that you perform righteousness. It says it directly, the righteous let him be righteous still. He who is just let him be just still. And when I ask them the question, brother, do you consider yourself holy? I'm afraid of God. And I say, what does this mean? This means, he says that I cannot say I'm holy. If you were, if you feared God, you would have said you're holy. You do not fear God. This is ignorance. 
Are you righteous? Are you justified? You have to be arrogant to say such things. That's what Episcopals say and pastors of other churches. The Episcopals, uh, the rank, they consider themselves a, a, a apostles, but they don't want to call them apostles. Everything is so perverted. The entire structure of rule is so perverted. How is it people can be saved? And so it begins as the fairy tales run as you will. Uh, the wolves are behind the mountain, but you run as you will. And whatever will happen will happen. Just run and get through so that you can preach the truth. But you need to first preach the truth for yourself. Tell, in your, tell it in your heart. The one that speaks the truth in his heart, he will be able to be upon the mountain with God or walk together with God in the all-consuming fire. We together stop to explore and study the first question, what characteristics and categories identify our inherited lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel. We need to consider that studying our inherited lot contained in the name of God, Rock, if we will be studying the power of His name independent from the faith of our heart and independent of the confessions of our mouth, then we will immediately be heading in the wrong direction. We understand that before confessing our inherited lot in the name of God, rock as a component of the faith of our heart, it is necessary to contain the virtue of a student of Christ, whose soil of the heart is prepared, who by listening receives the seed of the implanted word called to demonstrate its power in the fruit of righteousness. And we will remember also that, and I often remind us, that only a person that thirsts to listen to the word of God because God gives only to the one that thirsts, focuses upon the word. He pretty much uh, puts forth all the effort he needs for this word, lives by the word, abides in this word, and the word abides within him, will be able to stand in battle against the serpent of old and escape the deceiving traps of the devil in order to inherit salvation of his body by the redemption of Christ. In a specific format, we already looked at three components identifying the essence of the lot of the name of God, Rock of Israel. Therefore, we will immediately pay attention to the fourth component. David calls God the Rock of Israel. The lot in the name of God Rock within the heart of a student of Christ is identified by building our home or our dwelling place upon the crag of a crag of a rock. Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On the rock it dwells and resides on the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey, its eyes observe from afar, its young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there it is. Job 39, 27-30. The question that God asked Job, does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high. We conclude that an eagle that according to the word of the Lord mounts up and makes its nest on the cliff, dwells there and resides on the crag of the rock, indicates a righteous person who receives within his heart by revelation the preached word spoken by the delegated of God. In other words, it is he who is lifted up to this rock. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Isaiah 33, 15, 16. A po uh, prophet Isaiah, he, much later than Job, wrote this prophecy, but he knew the book of Job, and he wrote this prophecy, this very thought. Dwelling on high means being far away from a carnal mentality, and rather meditate and think about the things that are above. This is what the Holy Spirit reveals. What is God's height? To meditate about the things that are on high. 
to dwell is to abide and be and be present there. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 5 through 8. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks, means to possess a heart that is built into a strong tower, able to keep us in safety. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run to it and are safe. Proverbs 18.10 Bread will be given him means that the righteous is prudent of how he walks into the house of God and is primarily oriented on listening to the word of God and not offering sacrifices because this is the bread that is given to the righteous during the uh, time of service listening to the word of God. <clears throat> walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil Ecclesiastes 5.1 they don't think they do evil when they come to the service for the purpose of offering sacrifices <clears throat> offering of sacrifices need to be always be secondary listening to God and only after you listen to God then you're able to offer sacrifices because you know what kind of sacrifice you need to bring David says I will listen to what God says he'll say peace to the soul and then I will bring forth a peace offering because offerings have different uh, uh, there's different nature of offering but a person doesn't know the difference he thinks that he sings the song he offers a sacrifice he prays he offers a sacrifice but listen to, to these prayers and remember that when people are not taught to pray their prayer then consists of words parasitic words and most often you'll say, you'll hear it as, Lord, 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 Lord. As they say, dear friend, dear friend. As he, when he says, dear, dear Lord, dear friend. And he's trying to think of what else he can say because he's not, his prayer is not specific. He reads something and he's trying to say, but he doesn't understand what way to turn next or direction to go. His water will be sure means that the thirst uh, or the thirsty heart that has received the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of his life has been has become a spring from which the rivers of living water flow. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 37-39. It's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit here, but of receiving the Holy Spirit and to receive him you need to prepare and build yourself into an altar you need to build yourself into a house of God build yourself into a golden altar a uh, altar of incense and then also into the golden lamp uh, stand and the altar put wood upon the altar put fire upon this altar put the offering and lift your hands to God and say Lord I've done everything according to your word and then the fire will come down and light the altar the offering is brought by the power of the fire of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is this fire upon the altar and if there's no offering there will not be any fire there will not be the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that the symbol of the Holy Spirit is not just oil or water, but also fire, and so forth. Therefore, the phrase, from there it spies out the prey, its eyes observe from afar, indicates such a promise that is present at the door of our hope, preceding and so his eyes look afar, it says, observe from afar. He's looking for, for, for prey from a distance, from the height of God. 
This promise is at the door of our hope, preceding, <coughs> preceding our meeting with the Lord in the air and a guarantee that we will meet the Lord upon the clouds. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. Wilderness symbol of total sanctification, separation from your nation, the house of your father, and from your destructive desires. This is from your life. You lose your life completely in the wilderness, and I will speak comfort to her. There will the Lord speak to your heart uh, when a person pay, pays the price of total sanctification and will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Accor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Hosea 2, 14, 15, I will not distract ourselves too much on this, but we perfectly understand what this promise is at the door of our hope. The phrase, its young ones suck a blood, and where the slain are, there it is, indicates the confessions of the faith of the heart of a righteous person. The confession of the faith of the heart of a righteous person person consists in him considering himself dead to sin, living for God, and living in his carnal body proclaims the non-existent heavenly body as existent. It is this state of deadness to sin that gives God the correct grounds to adopt our body by the redemption of Christ in order to prepare us to meet the Lord upon the clouds. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on, have, uh, were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man was crucified with him the old person is not rebuked as a demon uh, put to dead uh, <clears throat> these uh, uncleanness and other things that are in your body which you will uh, you will see in false charismatic services where they try to rebuke the demon of fornication from the body but it's not a demon of fornication this is the old person and you can't rebuke him as a demon you have to crucify him and to crucify him you need to together with him come up upon the cross as Jesus came upon the cross and uh, caught uh, the reigning sin into a rat trap. And so Jesus resurrected, but sin remained, but only in hell, or stayed, but in hell. And so often I ask these, ask these people questions, where are your sins? They say, upon Christ. And I say, where's Christ? In your heart, yes. With your sins? And they, so what? Then he lives with your sins in you? Christ lives then within you with your sins, as you say. And so they say it's, a, they're, it's upon Christ. As the goat of as a zeal, uh, but they were taken off of Christ upon the and put upon the devil, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so he died, he, he, he died, and he died uh, for the sin that's in, inside of him and living for God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members of, as instruments of righteousness righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6, 3 through 14. 
If we are able, as an eagle, by the confession of the faith of our heart, to mount up upon a cliff, according to the words of the Lord, and build our home upon this height, in order to dwell upon this living stone and reside on the crag of the rock, then this ability within our heart determines that we have the lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel. Fifth, the Lord in the lot that is in the name of God rock within the heart of a student of Christ is identified as the shelter of God that is his Zion to the chief musician on a stringed instrument a psalm of David hear my cry O God attend to my prayer from the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I for you have been a shelter for me a strong tower from the enemy when he finished his way my rock of Israel is my God and he here prays for you have been a shelter from me a strong tower from my, from the enemy I will abide in your tabernacle forever I will trust in the shelter of your wings Psalm 61 1 through 4 the phrase to 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 the chief musician on a stringed instrument, a psalm of David means that the given psalm that is accompanied by stringed instruments is addressed to the chief musician. And in part, we've already, uh, we already know that the symbol of the chief musician is the Holy Spirit, called by God to form our prayer in accordance to the standards of the will of God and cloak it into power. The symbol of the choir is Zion, identifying the church, which is the chosen by God remnant as his dove. The symbol of the stringed instruments symbolize our new person, created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth. Any prayer that does not have in itself the unison of these three sovereign components immediately loses its power and is seen by God as rebellion and resistance against his will, which prompts the anger wrath of God and condemns the one praying to destruction or his prayer anyway to this to this destruction first united these three sovereign sides make our prayer legitimate as it identifies the essence of our altar upon which we intend to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God for our good service second united these three sovereign sides is testimony of the fact that we receive the Holy Spirit as the Lord and master of our life and are being led by the Holy Spirit Third, united these three sovereign sides is testimony that we are partakers to the virtue of the dove, which is the chosen by God remnant. Being a partaker of the virtue of a dove, we then have the legitimate right to the promise of the lot contained in the name of God, Rock of Israel. Therefore, only having the right to the promise of the lot contained in the name of God, Rock of Israel, are we able to pray from the ends of the earth that God has led us into a rock that is higher than us. The phrase, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Is the legitimate prayer, which is in accordance to the demands of the perfect will of God. To be led to the rock that is higher than us is an element of our calling without which we are not able to provide God the proper grounds he needs to adopt our body by the redemption of Christ before we will be lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. We need to pay specific attention to the character of the given prayer that is accompanied by a cry which indicates the fact that before we are led to the rock that is higher than us, we will find ourselves in difficult circumstances that David described in this way, from the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed from the end of the earth means from the boundaries of the earth which we see is our carnal body created from the earth from here he calls out from the boundaries of his body specifically understanding this reality prompted a prayer cry in David's desire to become free from the dependence of his mortal body by being led to the rock that was higher than him which indicates the fact that man with his personal strength using all of his intellectual abilities and his will abilities including fasting and prayer will never be able to give God the grounds that God needs to lead him 
upon the rock that is higher than him. In order to give God the proper grounds he needs to lead us upon the rock that is higher than us, it is necessary for our prayer to flow in the Spirit and be in accordance with the truth, and for this it is necessary to know the truth by the implanted word. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. This does, doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be just Jews. It could be, it is any person. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. And so in the beginning, you need to abide in the word so that you become a disciple of Christ. And only after that, you know the truth, and the truth that you know then will make you free from sin. When it says, I, I will make you free, that means freedom from sin. Because an absolute freedom as it is doesn't really exist. There's an absolute freedom of choice, choice of servitude. you either a servant of sin or servant of righteousness. God created men for himself either to be servants of righteousness. The devil creates for himself men as servants of sin. And when people don't want to be servants of righteousness, they leave such churches and then are freed from the uh, slavery of righteousness. They say there's such liberty, of course there's liberty. Now you can sin and the conscience won't condemn them because you have become a, a slave of sin. The essence of the truth that is able to make us free from sin consists in the revelation of the Holy Spirit giving us the ability to place ourselves into Christ, where we are able to be led on the rock that is higher than us, which is the throne upon which Christ sits next to God the Father. As it is written, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it and everyone but one receives the reward but millions are running all of us and all all times and only one receives the reward and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a perishable crown but we for an imperishable crown therefore I run thus not with uncertainty thus I fight not as one who beats the air but a disciple my body and I disciple my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have pre uh, preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. We run together with Christ, and Christ receives the reward. And so, we, He receives the prize. We receive it in Christ and with Christ. That's, that's the essence of it. He receives the prize and shares it with us if we fulfill the conditions in order to place ourselves into Christ. We need to know and fulfill specific conditions of how to put our, place ourselves into Christ and place Christ into ourselves. Furthermore, in his prayer, David gives one meaning and a clear identification of the rock that at the moment of his prayer was unreachable for him that he, according to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, perceived as his inheritance, about which he said, I will abide in your tabernacle forever, I will trust in the shelter of your wings, which indicates the fact that the rock that was higher than him was simultaneously the house of God, the wife of the bride of the Lamb. This rock is the chosen by God remnant, and God abided in her, in this rock. Summing up the given component that is the rock that is higher than us, we conclude that the lot of the name of God, Rock of Israel, consists in the house of God, in which a person can rest under the covering of the wings of God, as the Thummim, representing the truth of the elementary teaching of Christ within his heart, and the Urim, representing the Holy Spirit, that reveals the truth in his heart. Sixth, the lot in the name of God rock within the heart of a student of Christ is identified as the place of the glory of the Lord. 
Покажи мне славу твою. И сказал Господь, я проведу пред тобою всю славу мою. And he said, please show me your glory. Moses says to God, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So he can show his, him his glory. He says, here is a place by me <clears throat> where my glory is, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. It wasn't just a simple rock. It had a cleft. It was a uh, split. And will cover you by my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Exodus 33, 18 through 23. According to the given dialogue between Moses and God, the place where there is an absence of the glory of the Lord cannot be our inherited lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel. The phrase, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, indicates the fact that the glory of the Lord comes from the face of the Lord, just as the rays of the sun come from the sun. The rays of the sun are able to be seen and felt in the warmth that you feel. At the same time, to see the sun up close, as you see your companion, is not possible because of its high temperature. I will show you my glory, that is the rays that come from my face, but my face you cannot see. Anyone will see, who will see my face will perish. This is a devouring fire. This is the sun. Considering that the place of the glory of the Lord is the cleft of the rock, to determine your lot in the name of God, Rock of Israel, it is necessary to study the qualities of the glory of the Lord as well as the cleft of the rock upon which God will make all His goodness pass. First, what significant weight does this rock contain upon which God will make all of His goodness pass? And what qualities in Scripture do uh, do these? does this cleft of the rock have? <clears throat> and second, what criteria and qualities do the Scriptures give all of the glory of the Lord that He will pass in the cleft of the rock before Moses. The cleft of the rock upon which all of the goodness of God passes is a crack in the form of a deep opening that is formed in the stone, splitting the stone into two parts. The symbol of such a large crevice that separates the rock into two parts is the temple curtain torn into two, separating the holy from the unholy at the time of Christ's crucifixion, indicating the broken body of Christ for the sins of the chosen by him remnant. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest, and we know that this veil was torn uh, in two. It was split. It was the split body of Christ, through him we have free access to God. And having a high priest over the house of God, it is written that he, a new living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, that is confessing the faith of our heart when we consider ourselves dead to sin and we proclaim the not existent as existent and our bodies washed with pure waters. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who, is, who has promised is faithful. The large cleft in the rock upon which God made all his goodness pass before Moses is the new and living way in the temple opening for us by the sacrifice of Christ where he offered himself to God as a pleasant aroma. As Christ also has has loved us and given 
himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, Ephesians 5.2. The category of the chosen by God remnant that has risen to the temple by the new and living way, by the means of the boldness that she has together with the apostles, she herself becomes this cleft in the rock in the form of the new and living way to God for those that are looking for God. For all of the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen to the glory of God through us, 2 Corinthians 1.20. No one can be saved independent from the apostles, independent of the people that are endowed with the Holy Spirit that have the power of and authority of a father from God to be able to give the living seed. Second question, what qualities do we see in Scripture identifying all the glory of God that God made to pass over the cleft of the rock before Moses? When Moses speaks with God, please show me your glory. In Hebrew, this place of Scripture, the word glory means weight, something heavy or heaviness, possession, wealth, greatness, beauty, respect, honor, praise, holiness, and island. When God speaks with Moses, this is when uh, Moses had uh, said, please show me your glory, but when God speaks to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. In Hebrew, this word means to, I will bring forth a an army that is goodness, uh, this is blissfulness, well-being, possession, uh, kindness, and also Golgotha. This is also the uh, meaning of glory. Seventh, the lot of the name of God rock of Israel in the heart of a student of Christ is a stone that pours out oil. Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, that I were in the months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty yet was with me, when my children were around me, when my steps were bathed with cream, and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. Job 29, 1-6 through 6. In the given allegory, the living stone that pours out this oil have seven unique components that have between each other a miraculous balance as they are literally one and the other. They identify themselves in one the other and ident identify also the truthful nature of one the other. The absence of even one of these means that all of the rest of the uh, components are a counterfeit and that God is not keeping us then uh, but keeping keeping us but keeping only for his vengeance. He keeps those that are lawless for vengeance that nothing happened to them. And this is for his vengeance and they feel that they're blessed. But us, he keeps us because we are amongst great trials and he keeps us in order to give us his reward. And so we need to, at least in short, identify each of these components that we that are listed in this place of scripture to understand the lot that is contained in the name of God rock of Israel first his lamp shows upon my head second by his light I walk through darkness third the friendly counsel of God is over my tent fourth Almighty is with me fifth my children are around me sixth my steps are bathed with cream seventh the rock pours out rivers of oil for me and so they this rock is not presented separately, it is together with the rest of these, and so we need to study them all together as one, as one thing. When we're talking about the lamp showing upon our head, we are talking about the union and the collaboration of our spirit with the power of the word of the person that is placed over us by God. Then Ishbi Benab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David, but Abishai, the son of Zerui, came to his aid and, 
and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench, you quench the lamp of Israel. This, and so, this is Second Samuel 21, 16, 17. And so the lamp of Israel, the warriors in prayer, are people that are anointed by God. And so David was one that was cloaked into a father of God. And so having a lamp of Israel, we all, this is a person and we also have a spirit, our spirit that is also the lamp. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart, Proverbs 20, 27. But this is upon the condition that he acknowledges the person who is a lamp of Israel for the people. If he acknowledges this person, then his spirit will also then be a lamp for himself and God, and by his, through his spirit, God will reveal then. Walking by his light through darkness is the revelation of the words of the Lord in your heart. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119, 105. The friendly counsel of God being over our tent is the covering of the Most High and the shadow of the Almighty. That is the person that is cloaked into by the Holy Spirit into a father from God. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Psalm 91, 1, 2. He tells the Lord who God is to him in Jesus Christ. Because when he sees this covering over himself whom God gave him, when he hears the revelations God sends him, then he says that God is his refuge and his fortress. He, tell, he tells the Lord these things, who God is for him. Why? Because he lives under the shadow of the Almighty. The phrase the Almighty being with is with me is the uh, covenant or union you have with the commandments of God. You, you through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your percepts. Psalm 119, 98 through 100. And so having a, this union with the commandments of God that we understand, that we understand. This is that the Almighty is with me because God is with us with His Word that is anointed by the Holy Spirit. The phrase, our children be, are around us, is the fruit of the Spirit that abides within our heart which are God's promises. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Psalm 127, 3 through 5. And so, many children of God, in the beginning, or un unfortunately, their hearts are a cemetery, and so they wait that when they die, their, their God's promises will become alive. If someone could tell these poor people, these unfortunate people, that what died here, and if it doesn't become alive here, then they're on that side of life, it will not become alive. There we will use only those promises that resurrect within our heart here. The fruits of the Spirit, we receive these promises, we uh, apply them to ourselves, we rejoice, we keep them, we babysit them as a mother would her child, and we grow these promises, and independent of the great sorrows and trials we experience, we proclaim that not existent as existent, and we don't look at, and we don't focus upon pain and suffering, uh, the offenses, but rather we focus upon the reward, upon the promises that are already in our heart so that the time when the time comes to fulfill them the reader as the Lord will be able to easily read and fulfill them the phrase my steps are bathed with cream is the revelation of the truth that we are able to receive in the church of saints 
uh, being interpreted by God's delegated ones. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his root like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be re revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do with any idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Their fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let, let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the, the way of the Lord is right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Hosea 14, 4 through 9. <clears throat> this is what it means that my steps are bathed with cream love the pure milk of the word that you may grow by it in sal into salvation and so we can't produce our own milk someone else produces it and so to love this milk love the preached word the phrase the rock pours out rivers of oil for me this is uh, the collaboration of our mouth with God's mouth. And I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. Isaiah 51, 16. This is when we confess God's faith that is within our heart. And at this time, the rock for us pours out oil because we have become this living rock. Eighth component, uh, the lot in the name of God, rock, in the heart of a student of Christ, identifies itself in victory over the Philistines. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young men who bore his armor, Come, let us go over the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were, who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahit, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, and the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, but the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. Also, as we can see, it's as this crevice or this this uh, split stone. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sine. Front, the front of one faced northward opposite Mikmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young men who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if if they say, thus come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hands, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they were hiding. Then the men of the garrison called jo to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel, the hands of warriors in prayer, and Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed him, them, for the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about twenty men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp in the field and among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled and the earthquake so that it was very great there was a very great trembling now the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked you see you don't need to you see what faith does it 
uh, brings forth horror, supernatural horror and fear upon these uh, armies. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, and they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll, and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly Jonathan and his armor-bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here, for at the time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest, that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the went to the battle. And indeed every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great con, uh, confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews were, who were with the Philistines before the time who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country. They also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountain of Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Aven. 1 Samuel 14, 1 through 23. A very amazing event of what a rock, a living rock, does when you rely upon her. When you, the fear of the Lord uh, takes hold. The symbol of Canaanite land, which is the possession of and holiness of God, is the Church of Christ that lives within this mortal body here on earth. And it also symbolizes the Canaanite land. This is the possession and holiness of God, is our mortal body that is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Philistines are the root uh, or the for long time uh, dis, uh, sojourners or men that lived in Canaan or the land of Canaan and they uh, they were uncircumcised and so an uncircumcised Philistine within our body is our mind and the d destructive desires of our soul that have a pseudo-godliness or cloaked into or garmented into pseudo-godliness the uncircumcised uh, within the nation of God are carnal uh, men and are focused these people are more focused uh, to become righteous with works of the law and practicing of spiritual gifts and they don't obey the righteousness of God as they rejected God's will in circumcising their heart and ears and so throughout all of the Old Testament the Israelites uh, and the Philistines had uh, much battles and the one and the other would overcome at times and so the Israelites, of course, is the new person that created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth, carrying the spirit of life. The Philistines are the old person. The carry, he is the carrier of the fallen cherubim. The symbol of the heights uh, that is between this uh, crevice is the symbol of the Thummim and Urim. Jonathan is a symbol of the new person where we see the two great witnesses that stand before the earth, before the God of all the earth, the Urim and the Thummim. The symbol of the armor bearer of Jonathan is a symbol of the members of the body that is given as servants of righteousness. And so shipwreck that we see here that happened uh, in the in the line of the of the Philistines this was because of the Urim and the Thummim that Jonathan had and so summing this up the rock of Israel within our heart is victory over the Philistines from the position of the two rocks the Urim and the Thummim and so our time is up let us bend our knees and pray and we will thank God for the words that we were able to receive today. And may he give to us his mercy so that this word would become a part of our spiritual person. 
Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, again and again, I thank you and I worship together with your saints, your chosen people, that your heart favors because you have revealed to them your words, your promises that belong to the door of our hope. That is a great uh, testimony within us that we will be raptured. As Enoch in his time, you gave him testimony before he was taken up. You also have given us testimony. You're giving us testimony before rapture. May we be blessed before your face and may your words be fulfilled in us for our good. May the heavens rejoice and may the earth shake and may the powers of hell be shaken because of your truth that abides within our heart because specifically the truth in the heart and the confessions of this truth will shake all of the foundations of hell and will bring heavens to joy and victory. Thank you for this great wealth, for this great joy, for this opportunity. If so, someone of your saints, even though there's much good and much a word given to us, has fallen and is shackled by chains of sin, by your name, uh, holy name, right now I break these shackles of sin so that you can give to this person your forgiveness and they may be returned to your army. You are God and your mercy has not run out and it can never run out. We love you. We love you with the love that you have loved us. And you have shown us the power of your holy and selective love. You have shown us that you love one and hate the other. You have shown us that your love is directed toward those that are vessels of mercy. And you have wrath and anger upon the vessels of wrath. And that there's a verdict already. There's just a time that it will be fulfilled and it will be at the same time when you will reward your saints, when you will return the vineyards in the Valley of Accor, their youth. I thank you for these imperishable promises, this truth, these promises. May they be an eternal inheritance of your people now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen